Hey, what's up? I'm Bobby Joe. I'm at the big chair fair. And you're keeping the kids because you don't respect me. You push me, and you push me to rotate my chair. Originally, it was like, I just wanted a VR game where you're in a world with a character that's very aware of you, that's talking to you, that has a big personality, that you basically go on an adventure with. And then, you know, along the way, you're running into all kinds of other weird, bizarre characters who also are very aware of you and your presence in the world. I mean, that was the deepest sort of foundational, you know, basis for making this game. I love VR so much, and I appreciate all forms of VR. The stuff I really resonate with the most are the experiences where I'm there. Like, I'm meant to be there in this world. World, you're not just using VR as a really incredibly technologically advanced glorified camera system to peer into a game, but you're actually using it as your POV into the world as a, as a character. This is a power baby. You're gonna be seeing a lot of these throughout the whole game. I mean, I really love them. VR is such a bizarre and incredible technology to be able to do that. And so, yeah, I always wanted to like, just transport the player into the body of another character. A silent protagonist makes a lot of sense. There are some games where you are in a character's body, but you're hearing that character talk. I felt like, sure, it gives you a lot more control to write your character with dialogue and stuff in terms of just exactly how certain scenes or moments in the game play out. But I think the biggest challenge, more so than that, just comedic timing within the video game space in general. Because it's like, it's not the same as sitting in front of an edit bay and saying, oh, can we take a puff of air out between those two lines? Have the character react a little bit later here. You know what I mean? Very easy to do for TV or any of those kind of mediums. In video games, it's, it's like, there's a lot more going on because you've got the dialogue connected to a trigger, so you don't have complete control over the timing of that dialogue and when it starts. There's not really ever any cutscenes per se that we can, you know, perfectly time the jokes and the, the pauses and things. I, for me, it was very easy. It was like, you're silent. We give you the yes, no. Characters make jokes about it. We definitely aren't afraid to break the fourth wall or kind of wink, wink, nod, nod. This is a video game. A lot of times you're asked a question, like in the non-VR version, which is a feature that's only in traditional like PS4 version, not in VR. Like when you're asked a question, you're presented with two choices to answer and they're like, Cherorpion, do you think that this is gonna be a problem? Your choices are like a stained mattress, like a drawing of a stained mattress and then like a drawing of a glass of wine. And you're like, okay, a stained mattress. You're thinking to yourself, okay, pick that. And then as you would expect, the, the, the boss is like, stained mattress, what's the matter with you? Trover, what's wrong with this, this Cherorpion? Did he, what are you talking about stained mattress? It's got nothing to do, you know, it's like this whole fucking, it's just so funny. We do it in, we do it in a few spots and it's so funny to me because we're essentially, <laughs> we're essentially saying that you are, I don't know what we're saying about you as a character. We're forcing you to be just absolutely dumb. I don't know. I, I always kind of tend to feel like those sorts of moments, they get ahead of the cynical player. I think it's a symptom of where we are in the history of content. It's like everything's been done. You know, the, the sort of formulas that people use to tell stories and you know, what, what makes a story and why do stories need these specific steps in order to be satisfying. And at a certain point, it's like, okay, well, you know, for example, there's only so many times you can have a big giant bad monster who's gonna destroy everything. And the heroes gather together and defeat them before you're just like, I'm fatigued of this. And that's why you start going meta and breaking the fourth wall and just start playing with the very fabric of it. It's incredibly refreshing. I think it's refreshing to the writer and the creatives because they're like, it just has this feeling of like, we don't give a, f we do, but we also get like, who cares? What's it gonna hurt? And then I think it's refreshing to the audience because it's tickling that part of their brain that they already are thinking those things. And that's not to say, at least in Trover, that we do that a ton, but there are moments that if done right, it can be really funny. And I mean, the goal of Trover, you know, aside from just going on this awesome adventure with this unlikely partner, is just to create a series of crazy, weird characters, you know, just bizarro characters that you get to meet, but also just comedy, like absurd, silly, dumb comedy. This game is like, yeah, the stakes are high, and yes, like, the universe is at stake, or the cosmos is at stake, but we're still gonna have fun with it and just be absurd. Like, it's built on a fairly well-proven foundation of platforming and action and, and all the stuff that kind of, you know, is a staple of gaming that works. Uh, but then I think we go into areas that aren't quite as common to see in gaming, which is just the, the tone, the nature of the content, 
and then also just the weirdness, the weird factor is like way out there. So yeah, I, I guess it's really just a fun adventure. Mm -hmm.